Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dr. Natalie Greenwood and I'm going to be bringing you today's webinar alongside Dr. Leah Bell. Both Dr. Bell and myself are naturopathic physicians. We're both medical educational consultants here at DSL. We both graduated in 2010 together and now we work together in private practice with a clinical focus in digestive health. People used to always get us mixed up in school and now I'm starting to understand why. So our motivation behind this talk comes from the vast confusion there is around fiber and even fear around using fiber within our patient populations. Our goal is for you to understand the intricacies of the properties of fiber and to get really clear on how to confidently utilize fiber in your practice to get the best clinical outcomes for your patients. Let's simply start with the definition of fiber. Here is the FDA's definition. Dietary fiber in relevant part as non-digestible soluble and insoluble carbohydrates with three or more monomeric units and lignin that are intrinsic and intact in plants, isolated or synthetic non-digestible carbohydrates with three or more monomeric units determined by FDA to have physiological effects that are beneficial to human health. So this is a mouthful of adjectives and I just want to break down this definition and establish the key takeaway points that we need. The key points here is that dietary fiber is either coming from within and is intact in plants, or it can be synthetically made. Important in this definition is that it is containing three or more monomeric units, and you can see those monomeric units in the image on the right. It is non-digestible, meaning it cannot be broken down by our endogenously produced digestive enzymes, which is our pancreatic or brush border enzymes. It cannot be absorbed in the small intestine. And lastly, it promotes beneficial physiological effects to humans upon consumption. A big question that practitioners and even patients have is how does fiber come into play with our health and of course the health of our microbiome? So as mentioned in the definitions, we're not able to endogenously produce enzymes that break down fiber. So we really rely on our gut bacteria for fiber breakdown because they do possess an array of enzymes that can break down these complex carbohydrates. This anaerobic metabolic process is called sacrolytic fermentation. And as these microbes break down fiber into simple sugars, it results in the energy production for these guys. It also produces byproducts, including gases such as CO2, hydrogen, and methane, and an array of short-chain fatty acids, the most common ones being acetate, butyrate, and propionate. And these all have health benefits to us as our hosts and to the other beneficial bacteria in our microbiome through cross-feeding. The meaning of cross-feeding is just that other beneficial bacteria can use these byproducts as nutrients. The benefits that come from the byproducts of sacrolytic fermentation are going to be both systemic and localized, but I wanted to just initially take a closer look at the localized gastrointestinal tract and its anatomy to better understand that interface between the short chain fatty acids produced by our beneficial bacteria and then the layers of our GI tract. Um, so we essentially have three layers of barrier in our GI tract, and that first one is going to be the commensal bacteria. These guys are going to be found between the lumen of the intestinal tract and that mucin layer. So this is where all of our beneficial or good bacteria tend to reside. The second layer is the mucin layer. And actually in our large intestine, it has both an outer and inner mucin layer. And then the third layer is that single cell epithelial layer before um, the lamina propria that houses 70% of our immune cells. So the health of these three layers is so important because it's going to protect our immune system from any exposure to unwanted microbes and any immune activating proteins that could be coming from food or potential toxins. And then the byproducts of sacrolytic fermentation play a huge role in keeping this barrier strong and keeping the immune system stable. And they do so in many, many ways. So I'm just going to outline some of those now. They help to um, increase mucin production from the goblet cells strengthen tight junctions between the epithelial cells, decrease the release of cytokines and chemokines that recruit pro-inflammatory immune cells, and then they can drive T cells to develop into T reg cells, which help to limit autoimmune disease and are anti-inflammatory in nature. Um, when neutrophils are exposed to acetate and propionate, it facilitates um, phagocytosis of that bacteria. 
And then butyrate decreases cell division and increases cell death or apoptosis in any of the more reactive and inflammatory T cells. And then butyrate is the main energy source for those colonocytes. So it's what it uses as a fuel source. And because butyrate is the main nutrient source for the colonocytes and because in the absence of butyrate, these cells will start to autophage, um, it's really, really important to have butyrate present so that we don't start to have those cells die off or autophage. And then we get um, some severe intestinal permeability. So this slide is, uh, is providing us a great illustration on how sacrolytic fermentation is going to support our systemic health. And this might be a little bit redundant, but it's just going to help drive home the picture here. Um, so again, essentially those purple, yellow, and blue blobs are beneficial bacteria. And next to them, you can see um, gray, green, and blue triangle-like shapes. And these represent the carbohydrate active enzymes that those beneficial bacteria possess to help break down um, the fiber. And the fiber is represented by those red string-like images. So again, through sacrolytic fermentation, these bacteria can go on to produce um, short-chain fatty acids as seen with those yellow stars, and then gases such as hydrogen and methane and carbon dioxide represented by those blue bubbles. So those short-chain fatty acids or those yellow stars represent the three major short-chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. And these guys can be absorbed and then moved into circulation where they're going to have a, a wide ranging effect on the various cells um, throughout our body. And so here's just some examples um, of their effects on different cells. So nerve cells, um, butyrate crosses the blood brain barrier and it can promote neuroprotection, neurogenesis and improved cognitive health. In lung cells, short-chain fatty acids, especially acetate and butyrate, have an anti-inflammatory effect that may help with asthma and COPD. For liver cells, short-chain fatty acids regulate glucose production, cholesterol, and fat metabolism. They also reduce liver inflammation and protect against conditions like NAFLD. In pancreatic cells, propionate enhances insulin sensitivity and glucose regulation, while butyrate protects beta cells from inflammation and improving, and this improves insulin secretion. Lastly, in fat cells, short, short chain fatty acids increase fat oxidation, reduce inflammation, improve insulin sensitivity, and regulate appetite via hormones like leptin and PYY. So overall, these short-chain fatty acids offer systemic benefits, and those are going to affect multiple organs and tissues beyond our gut. However, here comes the confusing part. There's so many different types of fiber. We've got soluble, we've got insoluble fiber, we've got fermentable fiber, non-fermentable fiber, viscous or gel-forming fiber, and non-viscous, and low molecular weight or short-chain carbohydrates, and long chains, and high molecular weights, and... You know, it's really hard to kind of look at all these different subtypes and try to figure out, you know, what patient needs what, what situation needs what. Um, and, and Dr. Lee and I are really going to try to simplify this all for you and organize this information in a way that you can then, you know, reference it when you need based on your patient's symptoms and, of course, the findings on, on their GI map. To help with organizing the different subtypes of fiber, there are three main classifications that were established to help correlate how the chemical structures of these various fibers have differing physiological effects on our bodies. So in short, the physiochemical properties. Again, how their differing structural makeup affects our various biological processes. So these three main physiochemical classifications for fiber are solubility, viscosity, and fermentability. Starting with solubility. So being insoluble means that this fiber does not dissolve in water. It's actually hydrophobic and stays intact throughout the whole digestive system. It is either poorly fermented or not fermented at all by our beneficial um, gut bacteria. And what this form of fiber does is it actually creates an osmotic gradient and will pull water from the body tissues into the intestines. And this added water helps to form softer, bulkier stools and makes them much easier to pass. So it's going to help prevent um, constipation. So when you think about insoluble fiber, think about this might be a treatment option um, if your patient is constipated. Being soluble just means that this fiber can easily dissolve in water. 
And since it's hydrophilic or water loving, it attracts and holds onto water in the digestive tract. Soluble fiber also has the ability to feed our beneficial bacteria and has significant influence on the abundance and diversity of our gut microbiota. Soluble fibers can then further be divided into viscous or gel forming and non-viscous or non-gel forming. Being viscous refers to the ability of fiber to form a gel when it's mixed with water, and this will actually slow down digestion and it can help to lower cholesterol, regulate blood sugar, promote satiety, and again, its ability to hold onto water or absorb excess fluid can be really useful for those patients that have loose stools. Non-viscous fiber does not form a gel in water, so it passes through the digestive system much more quickly. However, non-viscous fiber can be fermented by um, bacteria. So think about viscous fiber in your patients that need help with managing blood sugar, cholesterol, and weight, and of course, if they have any loose stools. And then think about the non-viscous soluble fiber um, for those patients that do have insufficiency dysbiosis and are needing to feed their normal flora. Fermentability really refers to the ability of our gut bacteria to be able to metabolize fiber through that famous sacrolytic fermentation process. So essentially, it's the ability for our gut microbes to use fiber as their main nutrient um, source. The rate of fermentability, again, is going to just depend on that physiochemical structure of the fiber. So fibers that are long chain or high molecular weights are much more difficult for a beneficial bacteria to break down because they have the large and complex structure. And so because of this, it's going to be harder for our gut bacteria to ferment and this is going to lead to a slower release of short-chain fatty acids and gases. Whereas fibers that are short-chain or low molecular weight are easier for our beneficial bacteria to break down because they tend to have the short and simple structures. And so it's going to be much more easy for our gut bacteria to ferment them. And this is going to lead to a faster release of short-chain fatty acids and gases. So those high molecular weight or long chain fibers are generally better for patients that are wanting to feed their normal flora and it's going to also provide less chance of bloating because they do not ferment um, those types of fibers as fast. Whereas low molecular weight or short chain fibers are great for feeding our beneficial bacteria. However, we do recommend using them with caution because they can also cause gas and bloating and loose stools and abdominal discomfort just because our gut bacteria can ferment this type of fiber so fast. And lastly, non-fermentable fibers. So these fibers cannot be broken down by our gut microbiota and these fibers pass through the digestive system largely intact and they do not undergo metabolic changes by our gut bacteria. Here is a fantastic visual to drive home how these chemical structures of fibers differ. Image A is showing you cellulose, an insoluble, non-fermentable fiber. And as you enlarge the visibility of the fiber structure, you can see how tightly knit those hydrogen bonds are. It looks like a fortress for any sort of bacterial enzyme wanting to break down that molecule. You can see also all of the water that surrounds the outside, exemplifying its hydrophobic nature, but also its osmotic pull. Image B on the left is FOS and on the right is GOS. These are soluble, non-viscous, and easily fermentable fibers. You can see structurally how short and simple they are, those chains, and how very easy it would be for the bacterial enzymes to break them down. Lastly, Image C shows beta-glucan, a viscous, soluble, high molecular weight fiber. This one looks a little harder to break down, but not impossible. I also love being able to visualize all the water being absorbed into the structure. Think of it as the, col the colon mop, slowly making its way down the GI tract, mopping up all the water in its path, which is exactly what a viscous, soluble fiber does. It slows down that digestion and soaks up all that excess water. Now that you know about all the different types and actions of fiber, I think from here the best way to move forward is really to identify your treatment goals for your patient. So understanding the main things that we're going to treat is correcting insufficiency dysbiosis, um, helping with loose stools, trying to regulate blood sugar, cholesterol, or weight, or treating constipation. So Dr. Bell and I have put together this mind map to help guide you as you're working through your patient cases and figuring out what type of fiber would 
be best suited for your patient. And Dr. Bell is, is now going to speak further on the exact fibers. Uh, and we also have a PDF for you to reference to make this translation of fiber into clinic care really seamless. Thanks, Dr. Knapp, for that wonderful intro to fiber. Next, we're going to move into dietary fiber, including what are the current fiber recommendations and why are we struggling to meet those fiber targets? How does low fiber intake lead to detrimental effects on the gut? And how can we transition into a healthy diet that supports long-term digestive and microbiome benefits? What is the current average fiber intake? Americans are vastly under eating fiber. An estimated 95% of Americans are falling short of the daily recommendations. On average, females are consuming 15 grams of fiber per day and males are averaging about 18 grams per day. Globally, we see ranges between 15 and 26 grams per day, lower than the 20 to 35 grams recommended. According to the Institute of Medicine, the recommended fiber intake for females under 50 is 25 grams per day, and over 50 is 21 grams per day. For males under 50, 38 grams per day is recommended, and for over 50, 30 grams per day. This gap in our needs versus our intake is referred to the fiber gap. Some key contributing factors to a low fiber intake can include Western diet or standard American diet. This diet is characterized by high consumption of processed foods, refined grains, bread and processed meats, sugary beverages, and sweets, while lacking in fiber-rich foods. The gluten-free diet is not inherently low in fiber, but can be if not carefully planned. Uh, replacing gluten-containing foods with gluten-free packaged foods can be highly processed and lacking in fiber. Other restrictive diets, such as low FODMAP diet, can be low in fiber because it restricts high fiber foods, such as oligosaccharides. And the movement towards a low carbohydrate diet, such as ketogenic diet, carnivore, and grain-free. Knowledge barriers and socioeconomic factors, so not having access to things like fresh fruits and vegetables. And finally, modern farming practices. So things like selective breeding, milling and processing, excess chemical use, all focus on increasing yield of crops and reducing pest resistance. And this can often diminish nutrient and fiber content. Get a graphic illustrating the detrimental effects of a Western diet on the right in contrast to a healthy fiber rich diet, the Mediterranean diet on the left. Lack of fiber in the diet deprives beneficial bacteria of their preferred fuel source, leading to a loss of abundance in important microbes such as lactobacillus and bifidobacterium as well as a loss of diversity, one of the keystone pillars of a healthy microbiota. Without sufficient beneficial bacteria, short chain fatty acid production reduces significantly. So bacteria preferentially feed off of fiber, but if fiber is not available, they will resort to degrading mucin as a fuel source, which can lead to erosion of that mucosal barrier there you see in the blue. These changes increase vulnerability to infections inflammation, immune dysregulation, and lead to many chronic diseases over time. How can we create a diverse and healthy microbiome through our dietary choices? Enter the Mediterranean diet. This diet has been studied extensively for its benefits on many disease states and consistently demonstrates positive effects on the gut microbiome and gastrointestinal disease. Here are some of the aspects of the Mediterranean diet that positively influence the gut ecosystem. Number one is high fiber content, an abundance of plant-rich foods, including fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, polyphenol-rich foods, including olive oil, healthy fats, which also include olive oil, nuts, fish, and avocado, and minimally processed foods. These are some of the benefits shown in literature when following a Mediterranean diet. So improvements in microbial diversity, increases in keystone bacteria such as lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, improvements in the ratio of firmicutes to bacteroidetes, and decrease in inflammatory bacteria such as proteobacter. A few additional dietary factors for optimizing gut health can include 30 plants per week. So this can include things like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and herbs and spices. 
Fermented foods, including sauerkraut, kimchi, these have been shown to improve microbial diversity as well. And the good news is that the microbiota is highly responsive to dietary changes. So making small sustainable changes are key to creating long-term gut health. Here is a colorful graphic that displays the different dietary patterns and how they impact the gut microbiota, the gut barrier health, short chain fatty acid production and inflammation. I've included the reference at the bottom of the slide in case you'd like to revisit this. Now that we've talked about some of the dietary strategies, let's discuss where fiber supplementation can be useful and narrow in on specific types of fiber and when to consider using them. So it's important to understand that no amount of fiber supplementation can replace a poor diet. A food first approach is ideal to getting your fiber. However, this can be a challenge for many individuals. So when should we consider adding in a fiber supplement? The first is dietary fiber is insufficient. So if you have worked on your fiber intake through dietary strategies, but just not quite getting to your, meet your fiber needs, this can help fill in that fiber gap. Conditions, specifically constipation, uh, lots of research on fiber supplementation, uh, but also blood sugar, satiety weight management, and cholesterol, and then supporting microbiome with prebiotic rich fibers, which we're going to discuss shortly, and the GI map can, results can provide insight in guiding your decision on which fiber uh, prebiotics to choose. What are the challenges? So choosing the right type and dose for clinical efficacy can be a challenge for practitioners and individuals. Uh, so we hope to provide some, some insight into that for you. Possible side effects. Uh, can be common depending on the type of fiber and the dosing you're using, such as gas, bloating, and cramping. Drug and interactions, so fiber supplements can decrease absorption of uh, medication, so always something to keep in mind and follow the instructions uh, and speak with your doctor about that. Um, and then fiber, of course, lacks in nutrients. Uh, so it can, like I said before, it can't make up for dietary fiber, um, because it will not provide things like vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients. And then challenges with flavor, texture, compliance, and longevity. Uh, dosing, titrating slowly. So start low and go slow is a good way to introduce fiber. And very important is adequate hydration. So if you're not adequately hydrated and you're bringing in fiber, this can actually make you feel worse. So really important to optimize hydration levels, especially as you're increasing fiber. And then also understanding when to avoid fiber in certain disease states, such as IBD. So I think it's important to define what is a prebiotic. So prebiotic fiber can be defined as a substrate that is selectively utilized by host microorganisms, conferring a health benefit. And this definition was developed by the International Scientific Association for Prebiotic and Probiotics. And this is developed by a panel of experts in microbiology, nutrition, and clinical research. There are three criteria that must, they must meet in order to be a prebiotic. One is resist digestion. Secondly, it's fermentable. And thirdly, that fermentability selectively stimulates beneficial bacteria, improving host health. Here are some examples of some well-established pre prebiotics, which have been proven through human studies. This includes inulin, FOS, and GOS. And then we have uh, other prebiotics that have prebiotic, prebiotic activity and potential. And we're gonna go through these. Most pro prebiotics are dietary fiber, but not all dietary fibers are prebiotics. And not all fermentable fibers are prebiotics prebiotics, they must stimulate the growth of beneficial bacteria and confer a health benefit. Let's discuss some specific fibers, starting with some of the most highly fermentable fibers, inulin and FOS. This is a well-established prebiotic that's been shown to promote rapid growth of beneficial flora. Due to its short chain, it's very highly fermentable. It's also an oligosaccharide, which falls within the FODMAP category. So who would this be indicated for and who would you want to avoid this type of fiber with? For someone who is fiber tolerant and has low normal flora, such as low bifido, lactobacillus, fecalibacterium, 
and has mild constipation, this might be a good fiber to consider, but I would recommend starting low dose and increasing slowly to, to see how they tolerate. The patient population to use caution and or to avoid can be the IBS population, especially those FODMAP sensitive individuals. Also recommended to avoid this type of fiber, especially in active IBD, as it may increase inflammation and worsen symptoms. You can find inulin and FOS in many fiber supplements under listed as inulin, chicory root. There's also chicory root coffee replacement, um, as well as just listed as FOS. And then our dietary sources are listed here. So common ones would be things like garlic, onions, leeks, asparagus, Jerusalem artichokes. Another highly fermentable fiber that's worth mentioning is GOS or galacto-oligosaccharides. This has been a well-recognized prebiotic for over 20 years. It's also an oligosaccharide, so contained within the FODMAP category. So caution should be used in those sensitive individuals. So what are the dietary sources? Legumes are a primary source of GOS. Um, the, the enzyme that's required to break down GOS is called alpha-galactosidase, which is made by bacteria, but can also be found in digestive enzymes. So if you don't have the bacteria present to break down this fiber, adding in some digestive enzyme support, such as alpha-galactosidase, can be helpful in improving tolerance. So where this shines is in its prebiotic, benefits with bifido and lactobacillus, and also can help with the gut barrier function, stimulating mucin production and improving tight junctions. The next type of fiber or prebiotic is called xylo-oligosaccharide, or XOS. You may see this one in prebiotic formulas labeled as Pretic X. This is a patented prebiotic XOS that's been clinically demonstrated to increase bifido in the colon of both healthy and overweight individuals. It's also been shown to improve the ratio of Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes. Where this shines is it can increase bifidobacterium at much lower doses when compared to the other oligosaccharides. And this is, seems to be very well tolerated and effective at this low dose. Partially hydrolyzed guar gum is a soluble non-viscous fiber. It is fermentable, however, it ferments slowly, so it minimizes the side effects while supporting growth of bacteria. Within supplements, you're going to find this listed as PHGG, or partially hydrolyzed guar gum, but you may also see it as sun fiber, which is a patented form of PHGG. There won't be dietary sources. This is in a supplement only. And some of the prebiotic benefits on the microbiome include increasing bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, fecalibacterium, and also increasing short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate. This is considered a low FODMAP fiber, so this might be one that is going to support your more sensitive fiber intolerant patients or FODMAP sensitive patients. It also can help with postprandial glucose, lower serum cholesterol, and improve satiety. And the nice thing about this fiber is that it can help both with constipation end of the spectrum or diarrhea without causing bloating and gas. Resistant starches are a type of carbohydrate that resist digestion in the small intestine and arrive in the colon where it's fermented slowly, similarly to PHGG by the gut microbiota. There are different types of resistant starch fiber uh, listed here under dietary sources. Fiber supplements often contain ingredients like green banana flour or potato starch flour. These both fall into the category of resistant starch too. The resistant starches that have a prebiotic benefit are the ones that are listed in RS2 to RS4. And some of these benefits include increasing bifidobacterium, acromensia, and the butyrate producers. We also see increase in short chain fatty acid production, such as butyrate. So think about these ones with your patient population um, to help support low normal flora, also can help benefit blood sugar regulation, appetite, cardiovascular health. They're not going to have a strong effect on stool softening, however. There are many different types of pectin fiber. Here I'm going to focus on apple pectin. This is a soluble, viscous, and fermentable fiber. However, the degree of fermentation and solubility will depend on what type of pectin you're using. When you're thinking about apple pectin in the diet, this can be found primarily in the skin, peels, and core of fruits, such as citrus, pear, apricots, sour cherries, plums, and so forth. 
Some of the other benefits include improving microbes like Fecalibacterium, as well as improving short chain fatty acid production. It also has a great benefit on blood sugar control as well as satiety and cholesterol due to its viscosity and solubility. Psyllium fiber is a bulk forming laxative. Psyllium husk contains about 80% soluble fiber and 20% insoluble fiber. It's highly viscous, so it can help improve blood sugar, cholesterol, and satiety. However, it's not fermented well, so it doesn't trigger gas and bloat bloating in contrast to the other fermentable fibers. There's minimal effect on the microbiome, and there have been some studies that have shown fecalibacterium increase in the constipated population. Supplements are widely available in the form of psyllium husk, and where this fiber really shines is as a normalizer. So it can help relieve constipation by absorbing water, but it can also help thicken stools in conditions such as IBS, D, or diarrhea. And high doses uh, can, be, can worsen IBSD, so use caution, start low, go slow in those cases. Acacia fiber is another fiber that's suitable for a low FODMAT diet. So it's a soluble fiber, it's got low viscosity, and it has a slow rate of fermentation. So this helps to improve tolerability, minimizing gas and bloating. Supplements can include acacia fiber itself, or fiber gum. And dietary sources, it's not found in whole foods, however it can be used to fortify products. Microbiome benefits can include increasing lactobacillus bifidobacterium and fecalibacterium. And there are some improvements that can be seen with stool frequency. And it dissolves easily, which can help improve compliance and tolerability. Glucomannan is a soluble bulk forming fiber and it's derived from the cognac root from Eastern Asia. It's been used in Asia for thousands of years as both food and traditional medicine. One of its standout properties is its high viscosity. It has the highest viscosity and molecular weight of any fiber, and it can absorb up to 50 times its weight. This helps to improve and support conditions such as constipation, high cholesterol, blood sugar, and weight loss. Um, caution should be used with water because it is so viscous without drinking sufficient water can increase risk of choking and blockage. So really important to ensure uh, your patients are consuming plenty of water and must avoid this in conditions such as esophageal narrowing and swallowing difficulties. Some dietary sources can include things like Japanese shirataki noodles and sometimes is used as a vegan substitute for gelatin. Microbiome benefits include improvements in lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Moving on to insoluble fiber, one fiber I'm going to highlight here is called cellulose. Cellulose gives veggies its structural support, so it provides that rigidity and strength to plant cell walls to help maintain its shape and structure. So insoluble fibers, as a reminder, act like a broom to sweep debris along versus soluble fiber, which acts more like a sponge. So this is going to help add bulk to the stools. Um, it helps to stimulate motility. The bulk and roughage stimulate intestinal walls, promoting peristalsis to move through. And it can also help speed up transit time. So this is something that you want to think about incorporating in constipation, but you definitely want to avoid recommending high doses of insoluble fiber in diarrhea or IBSD. Thank you, Dr. Leah. And before we dive into case studies, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the low FODMAP diet. It has gained a lot of traction in the GI and SIBO world. And according to the American College of Gastroenterology, the largest body of evidence for IBS relief is around two specific diets. The first one being a low FODMAP diet and the second one being a gluten-free diet. I, however, want to bring clarity between FODMAPs and fiber. I often hear practitioners saying that fiber and FODMAPs are one and the same, and this is inaccurate. Let's break down what FODMAP stands for. Fermentable, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Fermentable oligosaccharides are the only fiber within FODMAPs. And to give a more physiochemical context, remember this is how the chemical structure of fiber affects our physiology, 
Oligosaccharides are made up of three to 10 monosaccharides. So they are those low molecular weight or short chain carbohydrates that are easily fermented, highly soluble with low viscosity. These fibers can move fast and furiously through the GI tract with the greatest potential for gas production through rapid fermentation in the proximal colon. This is your FOS, GOS, XOS, and human milk oligosaccharides. The other grouping in FODMAPs are disaccharides, referring to lactose, sucrose, maltose. These, of course, are not fiber and are or should be absorbed in the small intestine. Monosaccharides, referring to galactose, fructose, and glucose. These are also not fiber and should be easily absorbed in the small intestine. And lastly, polyols. These are your sugar alcohols like sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol. They can cause issues because they are absorbed slower through diffusion in the small intestine instead of through a transporter mechanism. This can cause an increased osmotic effect drawing water into the intestines. And polyols can also end up in the large intestine where they have the ability to be fermented. A couple important points that I want to make around FODMAPs are that the disaccharides and monosaccharides in FODMAPs can feed proteobacter. These are a more inflammatory phylum of microbes, which include E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Proteus, Citrobacter, just to name a few. And fiber does not feed these microbes. In fact, dietary fiber is one of the suggested ways to reduce proteobacter. Please don't mistake FODMAPs with all fibers. And do not be fearful to introduce the appropriate fiber in this patient population. Safe fibers for those struggling with reactions to FODMAP foods, like Dr. Um, Bell mentioned earlier, are partially hydrolyzed guar gum, resistant starches, and acacia fiber. Despite its attractive track record with symptom relief in our IBS populations, a restrictive low FODMAP diet should never be the long-term solution. If your patients do have a resolution of symptoms with a low FODMAP diet, we know we have to look deeper into the why as a healthy digestive tract and microbiome should have the ability to tolerate all of these substrates at an appropriate volume. I don't want to get into the intricacies around troubleshooting this patient population because I think it could be its own presentation, but I have put together a chart here on what I'm thinking about around short and long-term assessment and treatment for your reference. Key takeaways to think about are do I need to treat any proteobacter infections that can feed on the dye or monosaccharides? I want to assess what enzymes could potentially be deficient in breaking down these different length carbohydrates, for example, brush border enzymes for disaccharides and microbial enzymes for oligosaccharides. And or is there an issue with absorption of these digestible carbohydrates in the small intestine? affecting the osmotic gradient here. Now, I wanted to narrow in on the fiber reactive patient, and this of course will include those fermentable oligosaccharides that we were just talking about. But these patients come into your office presenting with a very limited diet. They feel better on a keto or carnivore type diet, and the foods that they seem to tolerate continue to get more and more limited. These patients are also terrified to reintroduce anything into their diet and can be really tricky is they have both physical and emotional responses around food. Again, going back to the basics in terms of the physiochemical properties around fiber, there are a couple of mechanisms that can cause the symptoms of bloating, distension, and sometimes pain in our fiber reactive patients when they're exposed to fiber. The first one is fermentation. As we all know, the response of exposing a fermentable substrate to a microbe that has the ability to ferment said substrate is the production of gas. These patients will complain a lot about flatulence or burping or the sensation of trapped gas. The second mechanism that can cause the sensation of bloating and distension in this population is an increase in osmotic load. The presence of fiber draws water into the GI tract causing increased luminal fluids. There are often two different shifts in the microbiome that can cause these two mechanisms. The first one is an elevation in normal flora. With an elevation of fiber fermenting bacteria, there is more fiber fermenting potential, resulting in an increased rate of gas production. This pattern is very common with digestive insufficiency. 
The reason being is if carbohydrates are not broken down by, by the brush border or pancreatic enzymes and then absorbed into the small intestine, these carbohydrates can escape into the large bowel where a normal flora can feed on them. Think of this as an endless buffet of nutrients feeding these microbes and giving them the ability to thrive and populate. This elevation of normal flora at the phyla level can also be seen with decreased motility or constipation as microbes have more time to ferment these fibers in that situation. The second is low normal flora. We know a multitude of microbial enzymes are required for fiber to be degraded into components that can be absorbed by the intestinal epithelium. The human gut harbors more than a thousand microbial species, and there are 260 documented cazymes or microbial enzyme families present in the human gut. If we have a loss of these species, we have a loss of our fiber degradation abilities, and these unfermented fibers will continue to have their water drawing effects into the intestinal tract. Here's an example of a fiber reactive patient with low normal flora. This patient has a fear around vegetables. Remember the loss of fiber tolerance is due to the inability to break down the fiber. She has a hard time to eat much because she just feels absolutely terrible afterwards. Lots of bloating and distension and dreads traveling and eating foods that she cannot control. A summary of what was found on her GI map includes of course the low normal flora, elevated zonulin and low secretory IgA. My goals for this patient are to decrease her bloating and then build up her confidence again around food. I have a green light here for my treatment suggestions and a red light for what I'm going to really avoid with this patient. Nutrition wise, I'm not going to change anything until she's out of discomfort. Then we're going to add in foods. And this is where I find the low FODMAP diet really handy in terms of organizing foods that I'm going to reintroduce. So remember, these patients are often only consuming a handful of foods. So a low FODMAP diet seems much less restrictive. Um, I started this patient with a low dose and a single form of soluble viscous fiber. In this case, I use PHGG. And I just made sure that she had control in terms of incrementally increasing this as her symptoms lessened. Bacterial enzymes are a big piece of this puzzle. And of course, the best way to get this full enzyme function back is through microbiome restoration, which we're going to do. But however, in this interim, as I'm working on that, um, there are some supplemental bacterial enzymes available that I find really helpful to decrease symptoms of bloating. And it also gives patient um, this patient population more digestive confidence. Crossfeeders will also benefit from the fiber breakdown intermediates. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is low dose probiotic. You could also consider a low dose of fermented veg here to support um, bifido and lactobacillus. Lastly, I'm going to support her with short chain fatty acid butyrate until those butyrate producers are back into a healthier population size and can produce their own. What I'm going to avoid in this patient population would be those oligosaccharides, right? The inulin, FOS, GOS, XOS, and any antimicrobials. We don't want to decrease this population any further. Here's another example of the fiber reactive patient, except this time um, the patient has high normal flora. So this patient is presenting with gas and bloating immediately after every meal, and it certainly continues throughout the day increase in flatulence, pain where her pants um, sit on her waist, and constipation. What was found on her GI map is high H. pylori, high normal flora, high pseudomonas, which is an opportunistic bacteria, and low elastase 1. My goals for this patient were to decrease gas and bloating and pain associated with that gas and bloating, and then to resolve her constipation. My green light treatment suggestions were to treat the H. pylori, which could very well be causing hypochlorhydria and stopping the activation of the rest of her digestive cascade. At the same time, I wanted to eradicate pseudomonas. This is a very inflammatory microbe that we know is detrimental to the small intestine lining and can really cause disruption to the brush border enzyme synthesis. During eradication, I supported this patient with pancreatic and brush border enzymes to just help her break down her macronutrients. 
And then I also suggested cellulose, which is an insoluble fiber to help increase bowel regularity. Psyllium would have been another great choice here. Lastly, I suggested a low fructan diet during this phase and at the end of this phase, so in about six to eight weeks, to slowly reintroduce these foods after eradication. My red light or cautions for this patient would be again to not use oligosaccharides or any other soluble, um, supplemental soluble fibers. There's really no need to, to feed these microbes further. Um, it could worsen her symptoms. Please remember that bloating and distension has a whole other list of differential diagnoses that need to be taken into consideration if your patient's symptoms just, you know, seem not to be resolving with your treatment. Dr. Tom Fabian did an amazing lecture that's worth watching all about bloating and distension, so please refer to our website for that. Next, let's discuss a case on integrating fiber for blood sugar, cardiovascular health, and weight management. Here is a patient presenting with bloating, a mix of constipation and diarrhea, lots of cravings, weight gain, blood sugar dysregulation, and high cholesterol. This patient is on a standard American diet, which includes very low fiber intake, highly processed foods, and a high fat diet. The GI map results on the right indicate a decline in the commensal bacteria, which is not a surprise given dietary factors of the Western diet. Summary of findings. So what we see here is that there's an elevation in the Firmicutes phyla, back, while Bacteroidetes is within normal range. High Firmicutes is a common finding with a high fat diet and Western diets. We also see low abundance of some of the keystone microbes. This includes Bifidobacterium, Lactobacillus, and Acromantia. In addition, we also find that butyrate producers are low. This includes Fecalibacterium prisnitsi and Roseburia. So what are the goals? Stabilize blood sugar, improve cardiovascular health, and optimize weight. So the type of fiber that can be really helpful here is the soluble viscous fibers that we've spoken about. These are some examples of some types of fibers that you can consider with this patient. This includes psyllium, beta-glucan, pectins, and glucomannan, and guar gum. The importance of soluble fiber is that it helps to improve satiety. It creates a gel-like substance slowing down digestion, prolonging fullness, and reducing calorie intake. It also helps with cholesterol as fibers bind bile acids in the intestine, preventing reabsorption, as well as blood sugar by slowing down transit, preventing spikes in blood sugar and glucose after meals. So some types of foods, food-based uh, soluble viscous fiber that you could consider would include things like oats, ground flax seeds, chia seeds, apples, pears, avocados, and beans. And I like this picture on the left. It demonstrates how viscous soluble fiber works through the intestine. So you can see on the left um, under B, uh, there's really quick absorption of uh, glucose through the proximal part of the small intestine. Whereas with the soluble fibers, you're seeing a slowed absorption and you get less of a spike and drop in that glucose curve. The second goal is to improve diversity and abundance in the commensal bacteria. So think four Ps for that insufficiency dysbiosis pattern. Some treatment considerations can include moving towards a more Mediterranean fiber focused diet working up fiber intake slowly towards that target of 25 grams per day. Using fermented foods, this is going to help boost abundance and diversity in the commensal bacteria. You could consider some probiotics here, including lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, and acromantia, and then removing processed high sugar and refined carbohydrates. We can also think about supporting those butyrate producers like Roseburia and Fecalibacterium with some of the fibers listed here. This patient's GI map indicated an increase in Firmicutes in relation to Bacteroidetes. This elevation in Firmicutes can be associated with a Western-style diet, as well as certain lifestyle factors such as inactivity, stress, antibiotic use, and so forth. What are the treatment considerations we want to think about here? A Mediterranean diet has been shown to improve this ratio, increasing Bacteroidetes and lowering Firmicutes. Uh, XOS or pre x this type of prebiotic is bifidogenic and has also been shown to improve this ratio. 
and physical exercise also is associated with improving this ratio and enhancing microbial diversity. I'm not going to go into a case study with managing fiber and an IBD patient, but I do want to show some of the latest research around IBD and fiber. The pathophysiologic changes that we see in our IBD patients are an increased presence of immune cells at the mucosal surface, inflammatory damage to the gut barrier, and there's also reproducible evidence that patients with IBD have reduced fiber fermenting microbes, much like that initial case that we already discussed. The combination though of surface immune cells, damage to the mucosa, and low normal flora creates an easier potential for those unfermented fibers to bind to the host cell receptors and subsequently promote gut inflammation upon consumption. So I'm going to oversimplify the image on the right here to just give you the take home message. Please do look up this study if you're interested in more of the details. But essentially, the image, um, image A on the right is measuring the amount of a specific pro-inflammatory cytokine that's being secreted in the presence of certain fibers in a population of patients with IBD. NF represents the no-fiber cohort seen with that yellow arrow. You can see there is minimal secretion of the pro-inflammatory cytokine. Fibers that have an increased secretion of the pro-inflammatory cytokine above the no-fiber cohort were FOS, inulin, maltodextrin, zymosin, and curidin. Zymosin and curidin are both fungal beta-1,3 glucans. Fibers that had less pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion than the no-fiber cohort were starch, and barley beta D-glucan. The takeaway here is that in our IBD population, using the fibers with the red arrows can trigger more inflammation than those with no fiber, and those fibers with the blue arrows could cause less inflammation than the no fiber diet cohort. What this image is showing us is that FOS increased pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion by a mean of 75% in active Crohn's patients and by 105% in active ulcerative colitis patients compared to those with the no fiber um, cohort. It increased to a lesser extent in biopsies from patients with IBD in remission. However, it did still increase pro-inflammatory cytokine um, secretion compared to a non-IBD patient. There was a 40% decrease in pro-inflammatory secretion in the non-IBD control biopsies exposed to FOS. So in summary, a non-IBD patient will have an anti-inflammatory response to FOS exposure versus an IBD patient. Either active or in remission, they seem to still have a pro-inflammatory response to FOS exposure. However, this chart does not take into account if those patients in remission have a microbiome that has recovered. Um, so we don't know their fermentative microbial potentials. Um, and so right now the take home message is just don't give FOS or longer fructin moieties to patients with IBD without knowing the status of their normal flora. What becomes super fascinating is that they then went on to um, simulate a post-fermentation exposure to these patients' tissues with a whole microbe uh, fermentation solution, and this changed everything. That initial pro-inflammatory effect from unfermented fibers now showed a decreased inflammatory effect um, compared to the no-fiber cohort. So for patients in remission that have mild IBD, and moderate to severe IBD, all of a sudden they are having a decreased inflammatory response to the exposure of FOS. Really, the state of the individual's microbiome matters in our IBD patients as to whether fiber supplementation would be detrimental or helpful for them. Here's a perfect example and really where the GI map shines because it gives us the info we need to safely support our IBD patients. Both of these patients have mild IBD. However, one has ability to ferment fibers still and the other does not. I would treat them very differently for this reason. The patient on the left has a remarkably balanced normal flora but high calprotectin. I would feel more comfortable keeping this patient on a higher fiber diet while supporting the mucin layer and using anti-inflammatory herbs versus the patient on the right with low normal flora and high calprotectin. I would consider more of a specific carbohydrate diet with low doses of brand-based beta-glucans 
mucin support, anti-inflammatory herbs, probiotics, and high doses of butyrate in that patient. You will tend to see patients with moderate to severe IBD looking more like the patient on the right with low abundance of the dominant fiber fermenting and butyrate producing microbes, Rosburia and um, Pecalibacterium presidency. And I just wanted to make a quick note, I'm always working concomitantly with a GI for any of my IBD patients. Please take a picture of this recipe if you're looking for a new fiber rich breakfast. This porridge is jam packed with 10 grams of fiber and it's my absolute favorite way to start the day. Thank you so much for joining us today. This concludes our presentation on frazzled by fibers.